Well, hey, what's up, Vibrant? Welcome to this next level content for the Watch the Throne series. My name is Zach Garrett. I'm the growth pastor here at Vibrant. Over here in the co-pilot seat, I have Jamie Robinson, our online campus pastor. And we want to welcome you to what we are calling, if you want to unveil the name, Jamie. It's the next level coffee cast. Coffee cast. I love it. Now, just to kind of differentiate what a coffee cast is, how did people get the name podcast because it's okay. a play off of that i'm going to give you my urban dictionary definition and if Official. i'm wrong please somewhere in the comments or wherever you find this or send me an email let me know but my understanding is that it is a broadcast that uh -huh. like a radio broadcast uh -huh. that has been created specifically in the beginning right for itunes that would stream to an itunes or an apple ipod to an ipod so you get pod and then broadcast for the cast. So podcast. Just another way that Steve Jobs redefined the world. Yeah. So My the goodness. iPod wow. is the medium yeah. in which the broadcast is received. But today... We have coffee. We have coffee. So One of my favorite elements of life. I love to drive. Delicious. I love conversation. And I love to do all that with a cup of coffee in my hand. So we um, invite you to ride along with us as we sip some amazing coffee, as we drive and just talk about Sunday morning's sermon, whether it's from Pastor Drew or whoever else has brought the teaching for the Sunday. Just go next level. Go a little deeper with that. So where did we um, just go get some coffee from? We are on Bridge Street in New Cumberland at a place called Brew Cumberland, and it's been around for a little while. They just renovated. Like when yeah. we walked into the building, I was like, where am I? This is so crazy. Yeah. Um, so if you haven't been to Brew Cumberland in a while, but you've been before, make sure you come back and go in because they've done a lot of work. It looks really great. It does look really good. And their coffee is excellent. Yeah. It's so good. What do you have? Um, so I went for the dirty chai latte, which you asked me and I didn't know what makes, what makes the dirty chai. Okay. So chai, a dirty chai is chai, which you're not going to, if you, let me correct you. I have a, like, I'm learning <laughs> about Indian culture. Right. We have a daughter from India. Right. Chai just means tea. So okay. if you get a chai, just say chai. You don't need to say chai tea. Okay. And so then if it has like it's masala redundant. or something in front of it, that indicates like what the spices are. Okay. So I've got a chai latte and then they put in a shot of espresso, yeah. which is where the dirt comes in. Gotcha. The dirtiness. So it's right. a little bit of a boost of energy, but it's got all those warm mm. chai spices that are, you know, we're mostly in our culture familiar with it with Thanksgiving and fall right. time. Well, we are moving into fall. So I totally got a pumpkin sweet cream cold brew. And uh, I mean, it, I don't know if you can tell, it has orange tint to it. It oh, tastes like, awesome. and see how it's just melting into the uh, the cold brew? Yes, it's awesome. it looks amazing. It is really good. So let's uh, let's hit the road. So I gotta tell you a story okay, while, we're, while we're driving. I wanna tell you okay. a quick story okay. about this place. Um, one of my favorite memories here, um, I don't know if you're a fan of Gilmore Girls or not. My Maybe wife. Maybe wife is, okay? My wife, yeah. So a couple years ago, they did a special event where a ton of local cafes all over the country for one day only turned into Luke's Diner, which is the place where Laura Lee and um, Rory Gilmore go for right. their coffee because yeah. they're a total coffee addict. So yeah. um, Brew Cumberland here in Pennsylvania in New Cumberland became Luke's for a day and you could get Luke's coffee and there was a line of women out the door. Oh, wow. No. <laughs> so it's really kind of a fun, a fun moment. I always appreciate the fun creativity of Brew Cumberland and just what they're doing here. And they've been a staple here on Bridge Street in New Cumberland for several years. And yeah. It's a great place to come. I think I think I saw on um, a t-shirt or a sign in there that they were established in 2014, mm -hmm. which just to me, that's crazy to think 2014. Oh, that was seven years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Seven years ago. Um, and you know, that's the one of the things that I love about this, this area. There's lots of nice little coffee shops and we're going to be hitting those, um, um, each week through this watch the throne series, I'm going to be, uh, having somebody different right along with me and hitting a different coffee shop and just giving a little shout out as we did to brew Cumberland and, uh, just have some good conversation going next level with, yeah. with the Sunday teaching. So we're starting this, um, series, watch the throne. And Drew did an awesome job bringing us into this story of David as we see it in 1 Samuel 16. Here's the prophet Samuel coming to the house of Jesse and looking to anoint the next king of Israel. 
But when I'm reading, I love to notice the stuff between the lines and maybe the kind of insignificant characters and go, okay, what can we bring out of them? And I looked at Eliab. And I think maybe it's a lot. You read the story and you, it's easy to go, ah, sucks to be that guy. But then I thought, I bet there's a lot of people, and even myself, at moments in my life where I can relate to being overlooked. And where Drew gave this amazing piece of encouragement of, and it's absolutely true, that uh, when we feel overlooked by man, we're still cherished by God. And here's Eliab, cherished by man. He's the, probably the firstborn son of Jesse. Even Samuel looked at him and said, hey, wow, man, this guy's got to be a king. But he gets overlooked by God. And I, I don't know. Is that something you feel like you, you can relate to? I imagine that's got to be a little bit of a, you know, stop him dead in his tracks. But I don't, I wouldn't necessarily say that he's been overlooked by God. Uh, like, like in the way that he wasn't forsaken. Yeah. But I think that there's... There's three points really that I, I that come to me when I'm thinking about Eliab. One, David lived in a season of life where he felt overlooked, right? Again, yeah. just because of where he was at in the pecking order of being the youngest youngest son. Um, whereas for Eliab, he probably was used to getting what whatever he aimed for, whatever he wanted to achieve. And so yeah. for David, it was a season. For Eliab, it was a moment. Yeah. Um, and what a, a profoundly difficult moment. But, but second, uh, because of what God says to Samuel of don't look at just what's on the surface, but look at the heart. Mm-hmm. I don't see what man sees. I, I see what's what's really at the core of who a person is. And it's when you feel like you've missed it, make sure that your heart isn't messed up. Yeah. Because I don't think it was that God passed him up or overlooks him and that I'm going to forsake you and I don't care about you. It was you don't have the heart that I'm looking for in who is going to be the next king of Israel. Yeah, it's the role. Yeah. It's about who God needs for that role and not necessarily about, like, who's the best person. Um, and I think that's one reason, too, why we need to make sure we're always avoiding the comparison trap. Mm. Because you can't... What's right for me is not always right for you. And what that role requires is not always the same thing... Um, that culture might think and especially so true with God and we know that what God is looking for in certain things are not what the world looks for well have you ever heard the phrase um, God doesn't always call the equipped but he equips those he calls Mm -hmm. well that's the awesome thing about David too is like he's already coming from a posture of reliance on God like because he's not the number one you know, nothing is on his own merit, something that he's earned or been, um, like entitlement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's a huge encouragement to anybody who may feel this, this compelling, this draw to go do something and go, but, but I don't have the skills necessary for this. But, um, and David didn't, didn't get brought up in a home where he was being prepared to, to be of royalty to be a king and you look at the disciples that were following Jesus like these guys were fishermen Matthew was a tax collector he was probably the worst person uh, to be following the Messiah except um, I think this is so key is that God isn't looking for the equipped he's looking for the humble the humble of heart and those who are willing to submit in faithful obedience what's when we hear this story and we think about like what Drew said about um, when you feel overlooked by man, you're not overlooked by God. Yeah. How should that change the way or how can that change the way that we live? What does that look like? Like what, what's the fruit of that? I think that connects to at the end where he said there is work in the waiting. Because let me go back to Eliab one more time. I, I, yeah. I don't think God was done with him. Oh, totally not. I don't, I don't think because he missed that moment where and for the other six brothers, um, just because God didn't choose them to be king of Israel, that means that their worth and their purpose was over. And so while you may get overlooked by man, and that may actually really be God working in the details and saying, this isn't what I've called you to, 
to, you know, the road that I've called you to walk down, but knowing that God is doing a work, he's doing a preparation, um, in that waiting. And then I'm just kind of connecting dots here, but then maybe it also tails into, um, God will anoint, um, God will, uh, how did you say this? He will anoint you before you walk into your adversity. Hmm. And I think a lot of that, that equipping, that anointing, that gifting of this, of, of spiritual gifts to prepare you for those battles. Yeah. It happens in the trials of waiting. Mm-hmm. You know what? I, I had a thought about times that I felt that, um, where you think like you're, you're going to do, you're stepping out on faith. You're going to do something different. The, the times I felt this the most is usually related to significant life change, whether it's the potential of a new relationship um, a new job, uh, different things like that. Specifically, I'm thinking about whenever you are looking for a job and it's time for a change and you, you look at a job description. I don't know if you're like this. I can really convince myself that I'm the person for this job. Yeah. Like I'll look at the, go through the job requirements and I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And I'll prepare for the interview. And I am really good at like selling myself, you know, in a, in an interview, but you know, the dangerous part is how much of that, like, and even I, I wonder for Eliab, like, so here's the job description, king of Israel, <laughs> mm. you know, like in his mind, um, you know, as he's starting to think like, what, like envision, like, what would it look like for me to rule? Um, and this is why I'd be a good ruler. And he's already kind of thinking through the things. And then you're met with that. Okay. I'm not actually the right person. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's kind of a formative time. Like I know, like when I have applied for a job and I'm like, this is it. Like, this is going to be the new direction of my life. This is what I'm going to be all about. Especially like if you're serving like a nonprofit or something, you're like, this is going to be my mission. And then you don't get the job. And so then you're like, well, I thought I was going to be this but now I'm not. So, Jamie, as we're driving along right now and um, drinking, at least for me, you're right, the pumpkin, sweet sweet cream, cold brew, mm-hmm. and even chai just kind of puts you in that fall feel. What really for you kicks off, like symbolically? Like you got to experience this or taste this or see this that makes you go, yeah. Yeah. I'm in the fall mood now. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say Chilean football. Okay. Yeah. Chilly football. football. It's that time you open the windows up because it's nice and crisp. Uh Maybe uh, an apple cider donut. You ever had an apple cider donut? Mm -hmm. It's good stuff. I'm from the Midwest. Hold off. I hold off on the pumpkin because we got a couple months of fall season. So, like, pumpkin, I really kind of lean more towards like the time in between Halloween and. Thanksgiving. Yeah. It's my pumpkin season. Yeah. Now, that being said, I have had probably had two or three pumpkin flavored drinks already. Yeah. But I am desperate for fall to happen because it's been so stinking hot here in Pennsylvania. <laughs> my it's wife. like 86 degrees yesterday. I'm like, where's the fall weather? Every time I go to the store recently for groceries, my wife has requested that I find um, pumpkin spice coffee creamer. Yes. Yeah. It's good. For me, it's got to be, um, I'm looking for a festival, uh-huh. um, because in the, in the town that I grew up in, in Southern Illinois, um, we had the, what's called the Little Egypt Parade, and it was, it's always the first weekend in October, and it's just, it can either be really hot or really cold, yeah. uh, there in that time of year, but, um, the hay bales are out and you have vendors that have fall stuff and there's um, local orchards are bringing their apple cider and apple cider donuts That's and things right. like that and just that festival um, always for me growing up really signified the coming of fall uh, but there's also something about that smell of a campfire smoke oh yeah you know a pe- s'more s'more people are sitting around a fire I just yeah so circling back, I think something that really stuck out for me with Eliab and David both is to not be a book that's read by its cover, to not be identified by um, <clears throat> what you put out, um, 
you know, how you portray your, how you portray yourself, um, because then you're defined by how other people react to you. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, say you're a really good worker, and people say that you're you're a great employee and you're a hard worker and you're good at the customers. That's great, um, but that's still not, I think, what I would want my identity to be. Yeah, because I'm more than that. Um, well, I'm a growth pastor, and I'm, and I'm a dad, and all those things are important. I once heard somebody say, never let your identity be, identity be placed in what can be taken away. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually learned, heard that in the context of, of sports and um, students who spend almost their whole youth, and may they do really good at sports, yeah. but there comes a time when they don't make that team. Yep. Or they didn't make it to the majors and they're done with college. And while their whole life has been built on how they perform as an athlete, when that's taken away, it leaves this emptiness, this void of, who am I? Yeah. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I had been thinking about that a little bit too. And I think I remember um, culturally, if you ask anybody who they are, like when you introduce themselves, they usually lead by what they do. Yeah. Um, and so our natural proclivity is to identify ourselves by what we do rather than who we are um, and and the things that really make us who we are. Um, But gosh, there's so much freedom to find in Christ and when we can really come open-handed to God and release the things that we've kind of made our identity and really simplify it and boil it down. Honestly, you can boil it down to two things, which is, the great, I think the greatest commandments, which is to right. love God. Can I love God if I'm doing this thing? And can I love others if mm-hmm. I'm doing these things? Mm-hmm. And the rest is just, that's the fun. Like that's the, the beauty, the improvisation, the jazz of life and, and allowing God to lead us. Um, now he certainly has given us specific gifts, right. but when we bring them to him, rather than grasping for control of how they're going to be used, we're going to have a much more, um, satisfying experience and we're going to get to do things that we never even dreamed possible. Let me give you an example. Mm-hmm. So I grew up at Vibrant, it was Capital Area at the time, and I got involved really young in the worship team. And so I would be singing, and my family, like, we're all singers and mm-hmm. instrumentalists, musicians, like, it's we have music in the blood, like, right. it's a thing. Yeah. Um, and so for me, I kind of learned that when I would participate in music and I would bring my best, that people would see that, they would affirm that in me. So I became the Eliab of music in my family. And, and so, that affirmation isn't bad. No, no, no. It's a good thing. And it, it's what uh, propelled me forward. And it set me on the path to where I am today. So yeah. let me fast forward. Mm-hmm. I decided to go into worship ministry. I feel God calls me to be a worship pastor in high school. And so I go to college to be a worship pastor, which is where I meet my husband, who is also a worship pastor. Yeah. <laughs> and so... I knew God had called me to do this and to serve him, but I also knew that my husband Alex was the man that God wanted me to partner my life with. And so I wasn't concerned with the details of how are we both going to be worship pastors. Um, But I knew that if I were to marry Alex, I could love God and I could love others and he would be the person to do that, to partner with, to do that in my life. And so that's the choice I made and then open handed on the rest. And so we get married, he's doing campus ministry. I'm working at like a local high school as a secretary, as a fill in job at the time out in Indiana. Mm -hmm. And we're really involved in helping the student ministry with their worship stuff. But it was kind of a, a tricky time for me because I, for so long, had identified myself as, well, I'm the, I'm a worship leader. I'm a, a singer. If I'm not doing this, like, how, what do I contribute to the world? And so I learned a new way of using those gifts to serve and equip other people. Mm. And then I, of course, had opportunities on my own to continue to do that. But it no longer became so important that I could not function. Like, that I, like, I still felt like I could bring value. And, yeah. like fast forward even more to today God has given me an opportunity to use things that I was doing back in high school like building a web page on my own um, to be able to serve people online and all of those things that that I was performing and where I was showing up and I was I was 
being seen, all of those things, even though that's not like, I'm not a worship pastor right now. Right. And I'm only on the worship team like once every four or five weeks. Yeah. And I'm cool with that because like, mm-hmm. I know that God is using me to, to make an impact and, and to make a connection and encourage the body in ways that I couldn't do that before. And because I was willing to, and I'm still willing to, cause who knows what's going to come up. Um, just really trust in his lead and see where the gaps are and allow God to use me in that. Um, that's so good. It's been a, an amazing experience. Wow. I never would have imagined. Sometimes I look at Alex and I'm like, could you ever imagine that we'd be broadcasting church into homes and people's palms? Yeah. You know, that we could have a spiritual experience and be yeah. connected with other believers all over the country and at different times. And, you know, and that God has invited us to be a part of that process. And here I am just a, just a singer. Yeah. <laughs> just a girl that likes to sing sing about Jesus you know <laughs> so let, let me connect that because I, I just saw this map in my mind yeah. of there is such a desire that we have as people to be noticed and cherished by our fellow man mm-hmm. and so so much of what drives us is what gets us or keeps us from being overlooked mm-hmm. by other people so part of it this well, we might have significance right and so much of what we do then, you know, in wanting to be, and maybe a fear then of not doing what you believe you're good at is, then are, are people going to notice me anymore? Yeah. Am I going to feel valued and appreciated if I'm not doing um, this, um, you know, by, by my people around me? But that's when, if we draw our confidence in, I don't really care if other people notice me. Yeah. I am noticed and I'm cherished by God. And so if he calls me to go and be a hermit and just study his word and prepare for four years before I start my ministry, like what, what Saul did as he was becoming Paul, yeah. that's fine. I don't need people to notice me. And it just frees you, as you said, to be exactly who God has called you to be because God sees me. Yeah. And that's really ultimately all that matters yeah. and I know that if God sees me and I'm and I'm following him I'm going to be I'm going to be dangerous for the kingdom oh yeah whatever capacity he calls me to do that in yeah so good